Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Just let everybody start to come in. So I'll wait until the numbers flatten out a little bit. I hope everyone is doing well. Thanks for joining us today. Just gonna wait a minute or so until the numbers flatten out. Okay, I think I can go ahead and get started with my introduction. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the latest IRS webinar. This is your host, Danielle Sumi, speaking from the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology headquarters in Washington, D.C. IRIS is a consortium of universities and an NSF-funded science facility that operates programs that enable Earth scientists to perform advanced research in geophysics, particularly in seismology. Webinars are recorded and archived on the IRIS Earthquake Science YouTube channel, so you can always watch this later again or send this to other people. The webinar ground rules are, are um, only the presenter, Dr. Richard Alfaro, and I will speak. If you have a comment or question as the webinar unfolds, then please clearly and concisely type it into the Q&A box, not the chat box, the Q&A box, on the webinar control panel. At the end, I will read your name and question to the speaker. If similar questions have been asked, I may combine or skip them. If the webinar crashes due to Zoom or internet issues or whatever it may be, I will just simply reboot it. And all you need to do is click the webinar link again and come right back. In the chat box, I will place a link to a short five minute survey. Your opinions and insight help us to inform future webinars. One of the questions we'll ask if you are watching this remotely in groups, hopefully within your pandemic pod, so if it's more than just you, please let me know. Today's webinar is part of IRIS's continued efforts to provide resources and tools that enable research and professional development. Our presenter today is Dr. Richard Alfaro, a postdoctoral research associate in the Earth and Environmental Sciences Division at Los Alamos National Lab. His research has focused on seismic hazards related to induced and triggered earthquakes and developing techniques to enhance discrimination of seismic sources. Dr. Alfaro completed his PhD in geological sciences at the University of Texas at El Paso in 2019 under Dr. Aaron Velasco. So without further ado, here's Dr. Alfaro to talk about unraveling earthquake stresses, insights from dynamically triggered earthquakes. Thank you. Danielle, thank you for the introduction and the opportunity to pre present today at IRIS. Um, so as you mentioned uh, today, I'll be talking about my research on dynamically triggered earthquakes and what we've learned about these processes in different regions. Um, for my presentation today, most of this work stems out of my dissertation, which uh, I did under Dr. Aaron Velasco at the University of Texas at El Paso. So we'll go ahead and jump right into it. Um, for anyone unfamiliar, there are different types of stresses that can trigger earthquakes, the most common of which is a change in static stress. As illustrated in figure A on the left hand side, uh, we have a fault at the center uh, and this fault ruptures and displaces uh, the nearby um, stress field, um, which causes a change in Coulomb stresses around in the near field of the fault. Um, and this change in stress may, uh, may um, either advance or retard uh, a seismic cycle on nearby receiver faults. Another way that we can trigger earthquakes is via dynamic stress. And dynamic stresses are typically generated uh, by the passage of seismic waves, generally surface waves, from a distant earthquake. Here we have an example of how this process works. A large earthquake might occur in Japan uh, that's illustrated by the yellow star there. And as this, uh, this earthquake generates uh, surface waves which can travel through the Earth's crust and will eventually arrive, uh, let's say somewhere in the United States. And here the surface waves can interact with a fault uh, that may be 
may happen to be critically stressed and the transient stressing uh, due to the surface wave arrivals here um, actually cause the fault to fail. As illustrated here, surface waves can transfer stress over great distances. Um, and the focus of this pre presentation will be pr primarily on examining triggered earthquakes uh, as, as we've illustrated here. A third mechanism that you can trigger earthquakes by is induced stress. Um, induced stresses are incited by anthropogenic activity, typically related to gas and oil production. Um, and typically it's incited by changing a stable state of stress through subsurface fluid injection and or CS CO2 sequestration. In the figure below, we have a map of seismicity magnitude three and above from 1973 to 2002. If you take a look at the histogram on the figure, they're blue and red bars, which represent the number of earthquakes per year. You can see the number of earthquakes in this region dramatically increases after 2008. This rise is related to anthropogenic influences and subsurface fluid injection. Now turning back to the subject of dynamic triggering, um, as I mentioned before, dynamic triggering is typically caused by stress imposed uh, by the passes of surface waves. Here we have an example of uh, two remote teleseismic earthquakes that trigger seismicity on the right hand, uh, sorry, on the left hand side. We have an example of Rayleigh wave triggering that was incited by the 2004 magnitude nine Sumatra earthquake. Um, the, ver the very top, um, can, can you see my cursor? Um, yes, I can. Yep, just took okay, me a second. Great. So mm -hmm. the, very, the very top record is a transverse uh, record which shows the love wave arrival. Um, the next record is the Rayleigh wave arrival. And if we filter this channel, um, we can see that there is a small earthquake. If we filter and zoom into this, this, this section, we can see there's a small earthquake triggered by the Rayleigh wave arrival. Um, here on the right-hand side, we have another example. Uh, this event was incited by the love wave arrival of the 2002 magnitude 7.9 Denali fault earthquake. <clears throat> so again, if we filter this we and zoom in here, we can see there's a small earthquake triggered by the arrival of a love wave from this event. So we, we won't be talking much about triggered tremor here, but I, I did want to show this example of triggered tremor incited by the Denali Fault earthquake in Parkfield, California. So over here we have a, the love wave arrival that actually triggers a tremor and you can see the signal in a spectrogram here. Um, triggered tremor has also been identified in several regions including the Cascadia subduction zone, Japan and Cuba. So just a little interesting um, insight there. Um, so the, the, the challenge in identifying dynamic triggering dynamically triggered earthquakes is really, it requires searching through thousands of waveforms um, to identify these sometimes very small and isolated uh, earthquakes. Um, earthquake catalogs can sometimes miss these events because they, they may be masked by the surface wave arrivals of these distant teleseismic earthquakes. So uh, during my dissertation, we focused on uh, developing a couple of different detection models that use a short-term average to long-term average uh, algorithm uh, to process waveform data from the US array and regional networks. Here I've listed a couple of the different detection models that we designed. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have a table of the parameters that we uh, put together for the, each of these different models and their purpose. Uh, some of these are focused on identifying uh, very local events. Uh, some are for more regional and some are uh, focused on identifying surface wave arrivals. 
Um, on the right hand side, you can see how the SCA LTA uh, method works. It's just a, a figure to show how it works. It creates an envelope based on the these different averages. On this slide, I have an example of how our different detection models performed at the station uh, A and MO. And you can see that some of these uh, detection models identify a significant amount of significantly more signals than others. Um, in, particularly some, in particular, some of these detection models are very prone to identifying noise. Um, we found uh, that the most effective detection model that we developed uh, to identify these locally triggered earthquakes was the EV1 model, which we use in our subsequent studies. Um, on this slide, I have an example. Uh, here, here we have an example of our detection uh, in a in an instant, two instantaneously triggered events that our detectors identified on a high signal to noise station, um, TA station R11A. Um, we identified tr two triggered earthquakes, one incited by the uh, S wave arrival and another incited by the love wave arrival of um, originating from the magnitude 8.8 2010 Chile earthquake. Um, once we identified this, we went ahead and inspected the Southern California Seismic Network catalog to see if there was any further activity. And looking at this catalog uh, a week before uh, this Chile event in COSO, we found only 23 events in the, in the region. And uh, a week after the seismicity rate uh, was elevated to 66 events. Um, so there were several, and, and it's, it's worth noting that several of these events um, that were triggered by the Chile earthquake in the Coso region were also of significantly higher magnitude. Um, the, these observations uh, actually sparked a study uh, on the Coso geothermal field that I'll be discussing in some later slides. So we, we've got this detection uh, method put together um, and we, we're interested in a couple of different questions. Uh, so we, we, we're, we wanna look at the entire US array um, and sort of figure out if, is there a stress threshold for triggering? Um, we wanna understand if, the relation, if there's some sort of relationship between the local stress field and the orientation the surface waves are coming in at. <clears throat> and we wanna know if some regions are more susceptible to be dynamically triggered than others. And another thing that we're interested in is looking, trying to find out if there's any insight that natural earthquake triggering can give us related to induced events. So going back to our previous observations of dynamic triggering in the coastal geothermal field, um, we decided to shift our study to, to this specific area. Our motivation in studying the coastal geothermal field was similar to those that I stated before, but we wanted to evaluate the local stress field and how these teleseismic in earthquakes interact with this region. Um, furthermore, we're interested in analyzing uh, different attributes related to dynamic triggering. Um, these include uh, wave type, uh, back azimuth orientation, peak dynamic stress, and assessing how these factors contribute to triggered seismicity. So for the coastal geothermal field, we analyzed a 13 year period. We uh, looked at 211 um, teleseismic earthquakes that were magnitude seven and above. And we analyzed a window of five hours before and after each of these teleseismic earthquakes. Um, we also compiled regional stress information that includes um, SH max, max measurements uh, from the world stress map and also focal, me focal mechanisms that were available. 
on the figures on the right here, we have a size, catalog seismicity that is plotted um, by magnitude, but scaled by magnitude and colored by depth. Um, on figure B, we have the focal mechanism catalog that we, we were looking at. Um, so for the COSO geothermal field, we actually found a pretty strong tendency that it was triggered uh, by teleseismic events. Uh, we actually found that 41 out of the 211 teleseismic earthquakes we studied in the region uh, triggered uh, a, a statistically significant increase in seismicity in the region. We identified <clears throat> Over 300, uh, over 300 locally triggered earthquakes. Uh, 57 of these were instantaneously triggered, um, either by a love wave, Rayleigh wave, or an S phase arrival. And we identified around 200 delayed triggered earthquakes. Um, below we have uh, the locations and the focal mechanisms of these uh, triggered events. Um, Figure A shows the, the triggered events uh, color-coded by depth, and figure B shows the focal mechanisms that are available for some of these specific triggered events. So one thing we're interested in looking at is how what is controlling triggering in this region? And something that we found was that it may not necessarily be the magnitude of the peak dynamic stress, but the orientation that the waves are coming in at. And it seemed that most of these uh, triggered events were being triggered by uh, event arrivals that were coming in at a specific azimuth, azimuth that's about uh, aligning approximately perpendicular to the regional stress field. Um, so on the right here, I have the back azimuths plotted as a in, in relation to the peak dynamic stress. And we can see that generally instantaneously triggered events uh, are being triggered a, a approximately 90 degrees away from the average regional stress orientation. Uh, we have a range of peak dynamic stresses that trigger this region um, that I have listed on the left hand side there. Um, here um, I have uh, locally triggered local triggered events uh, plotted as focal mechanisms as well as orange lines and the lines are oriented and in the direction of the triggering wave is coming in at. And as you can see, if we look at the local stress field, which S, which is SA, represented as SH max here, um, which are the green lines uh, for the most part. Um, the direction these waves are coming in at is pretty much perpendicular to either the local fault orientations or the SH max orientations in the region. So we're, we're finding that there's some sort of azimuthal dependence in the COSO geothermal field. So to summarize, our findings for COSO. We found a 41 of the 211 earthquakes we studied triggered seismicity in the geothermal field and adjacent regions. Uh, there's, def there's different types of triggering. We observed delayed triggering, uh, Rayleigh wave, love, and S wave triggering. Uh, we, we didn't find an apparent stress threshold to the triggering here, nothing that popped out in the data. Uh, there appears to be some sort of orientation control that um, the triggering is re relying on in the region. And it, it seems that the, the, the COSO region is uniquely positioned to be triggered uh, by earthquakes that originate from the West Pacific and and South America. So 
now I'm going to move on to um, some studies that we've done in, in Oklahoma looking at dynamic triggering and induced environments. So the, the motivation here, um, of course, is also to explore uh, dynamic triggering um, in documented regions of induced seismicity. <clears throat> um, we're interested in exploring the, the, the role of fluids and wave types in the triggering process and looking at whether we can use uh, dynamic triggering um, to assess seismic hazards or potentially identify faults um, that are of concern in the region. So for Oklahoma, uh, we took a look at 126 earthquakes that are magnitude seven and above from 2010 to 2016. Um, again, we're looking at uh, five hours before and after uh, each, each event. Um, we ran the detectors we designed across uh, the US array and in other available regional network stations. On the right here, we have uh, regional stress field information that we compiled uh, from SNE and Zovac to 2020. Um, so these are just plotting the SH max orientation for the regions, and we have regional plots of faults plotted on there as well. Uh, for our se seismic catalog, uh, we looked at uh, sco the SCOMOL catalog that was published in 2020. Um, this catalog is a template match catalog that includes over 200,000 uh, earthquakes from 2010 to 2016. Um, and the magnitudes of these events range from negative 0.8 to 5.8. Um, on the bottom here, I have the, on the bottom left here, I have the earthquake catalog plotted as green circles. Uh, major events are highlighted as red, red stars, uh, which include the Prague uh, magnitude 5.7 and Pon Pawnee magnitude 5.8 in 2016. And on the right here, I just have a histogram of the event count for the catalog. And again, the, the major events highlighted there. So examining this catalog, we found 25 main shocks, about 20% of what we studied um, actually triggered seismicity in Oklahoma. Um, so these uh, triggered events are identified by statistically significant rate changes. I, I'm not gonna get into the statistics, but I'd be happy to discuss that with anyone that's interested. Um, to ensure we're not missing any, any earthquakes that might have been masked by surface wave arrivals, we actually visually inspect uh, all of these waveforms that are available for these events. Um, we, were <clears throat> we were able to identify uh, 483 triggered earthquakes throughout Oklahoma, um, a good portion of which were actually delayed triggered events. Um, and 211 which were instantaneously triggered. So on the right here, I have a plot of the background seismicity. And <clears throat> in the gray circles are background seismicity and the colored circles are triggered earthquakes. And they are color coded according to the, uh, the teleseismic event they are associated with. Um, and the, the time at which this tell seismic event occurred is, is highlighted in the, the legend below here. So we, we observed several different types of triggering throughout Oklahoma. Um, predominantly, uh, it, it appears that Rayleigh wave uh, triggers seismicity in Oklahoma. So right here, we have an example of the magnitude five, uh, sorry, seven, 0.7 earthquake from the Scotia Sea in 2013. Uh, we can see uh, as soon as the Rayleigh wave arrives, we have a huge jump in uh, the cumulative count of earthquakes. So there's a huge jump in the seismicity there. Um, below, we have the areas that are getting triggered by this specific event uh, and their geographic locations. 
Uh, here we have another example that is uh, primarily a delayed triggered event. So you can see the seismic wave arrivals come through and then shortly after the coda of that earthquake, uh, there's a sharp increase in the seismicity rate. Um, and these events are uh, shown below, their geographic locations below. Um, so, so here are just some waveform examples of what we're, we're observing. Um, this was an event that wasn't cataloged um, that's related to the 2010 uh, February 27th, 7.4 Chile earthquake. Um, and this is actually incited by a love wave arrival, which it was indicating that there's no uh, uh, fluid mechanism involved in this, tr this specific triggered event. And here we have another um, example of um, <clears throat> triggered events. Uh, some are incited by the surface waves and there's a, a couple that are caused by, uh, that are delay triggered. And this is incited by the 2010 uh, magnitude 7.8 Indonesia earthquake. Um, so, Looking at the back azimuth orientations, we're, we're looking to see if we saw any sort of pattern similar to what we saw in the COSO geothermal field. And it appears there's no specific uh, back azimuth that's aligning that triggers uh, oh, the Oklahoma region um, at first glance, at least. And there's a pretty wide range of uh, uh, peak dynamic stresses that we've measure, measured that are triggering uh, the region. Um, however, if we split uh, these triggered earthquakes off into their uh, triggering phase type um, and plot them as a function of their back azimuth, uh, we start to see that there's some sort of pattern uh, that's real, that, that may be related to the orientation of local faults in the region or SH max. Um, so here we have each of these lines represents an earthquake um, and it's plotted as a function, the direction of the line is plotted as a function of the back azimuth orientation of the uh, teleseismic earthquake to that specific um, local earthquake. Um, and if we just come, so, so I should mention this is, this is still a work in progress, but if we just visually look at the directions these, these uh, locally triggered earthquakes uh, and their back azimuths align with <clears throat> the local SH max in Oklahoma, it, it looks like there's some sort of pattern here. Um, and as if they are aligning perpendicular to SH max, similar to uh, how they were aligning in the COSO geothermal field. So here we have a histogram of uh, the back azimuths of triggered earthquakes on the left hand panel, and they're separated out into the uh, specific phase that um, triggered the earthquake. And if we look at these back azimuths, we can see that there is obviously a, a specific orientation that, that stands out um, compared to the rest. Um, we've also got the orientations of the SH, sorry, the SH max orientations for Oklahoma plotted from Snee and Zoback 2020 on the right hand panel here. And it seems that there, there, there might be a relationship here um, that's worth further investigation and exploiting. So a, a little further analysis, since we're, we're trying to see if there are specific uh, regions that are more susceptible than others to be triggered, uh, I, I, I went ahead and looked at triggered event density and you can see that there's a couple areas that are that get highlighted here um, in central Oklahoma that may indicate that those areas are specifically uh, critically stressed. 
Um, so this is just another preliminary figure, but I, I'd like to share it. Um, so, so for Oklahoma, uh, what our analysis has shown us so far, um, we don't necessarily know if there's a triggering threshold for Oklahoma yet. Um, further analysis is ne definitely necessary to determine site-specific thresholds if there is one, if there is any. Um, it seems that the relationship between the local stress orientation SH max and the orientations of incoming surface waves might control um, triggering in some regions, um, it appears. Um, we need to do further analysis and calculate focal mechanisms to confirm that in some regions. Uh, we believe we believe that natural earthquake triggering, triggering can give us insight into induced events. Uh, Oklahoma is very active, but um, we think that the triggered earthquakes we're observing uh, might give us some insight into what regions of Oklahoma are critically, critically stressed. And whether uh, triggered earthquakes can provide um, information on the state of uh, on a fault state of stress, um, we we need some further understanding of the stress field um, related to earthquake initiation. Uh, but dynamically triggered sequences might indicate it might be might be indicative of a fault reaching critical straight state and nearing failure. So we, we've observed different types, uh, as we did in, in COSO, different types of uh, dynamic triggering uh, coincident with uh, Rayleigh wave and Love waves. Uh, we've also observed several delay triggered events. Um, Oklahoma seems to be pretty well dominated by uh, delay triggered events and we attribute, it, attribute that to um, the anthropogenic uh, influence in the region. Um, different, you know, these different populations of triggered events might indicate different uh, physical mechanisms at work. Um, and Oklahoma seems to be, a, we're, we're looking at anal analyzing things further uh, to gain more insight here. Um, so overall, we, we believe that dynamic triggering can provide um, us insight into the local stress field um, and induce stresses. Uh, dynamic triggering, we believe, might be able to be, might be useful as a proxy to understanding local stress, stress, local stress states. Um, and I think that's about all I've got. Um, if anyone's interested, I do have some extra slides that go into uh, more details uh, related to uh, dynamic triggering on specific faults in Oklahoma, and I'd be happy to share that. Um, uh, thank you for your time. Great, thank you so much, Richard. Um, we do have a couple of questions already. Um, Kellen Wang asks, um, if a triggered event occurs after both Love and Rayleigh, how do we know which phase is the triggering phase? especially if the event is slightly delayed? Um, it, it would likely be the Rayleigh wave. Um, and a way we could go about that, of course, is you know in, investigating the seismograms and, and measuring uh, the uh, specific transient stresses that are related to each, each of those phases to see which one might be greater. But um, I, I, it, it's likely the Rayleigh wave because I, I just don't see how the tr that stress could be stored um, but Rayleigh waves could cause um, some sort of fluid diffusion effect um, that would cause things to be, be delayed and cause triggering to be delayed in the system. Okay, great, thanks. Um, David Shelley asks, um, thanks for the talk. Um, how do you distinguish between delayed triggered events and background or untriggered events? Have you tried examining data at random times as a control data set? 
So yes, we have uh, looked at data at random times. Um, so if I'm under understanding the question right, it, it was also how do we distinguish delayed triggered events? Um, sorry, could you repeat that one? Sure, yeah. How do we distinguish between delayed triggered events and background untriggered events? Um, have you tried examining the data at random times as a control data set? Yeah, so it, it, we, we use, the, use some st different statistical measurements to look at them. Um, and it's, it's really just correlating these rate increases to uh, the transient stresses that are um, imparted by these distant earthquakes um, and checking if the rate increase is making sure that if we're looking at an induced area, making sure the rate increase is not related to some sort of uh, injection related activity. Great. Marcelo um, asked some cow, I'm sure I butchered that, but um, how long do you define a delayed trigger in Oklahoma? Are there many sudden rate increases without previous large earthquakes? So for Oklahoma specifically, we're, we're looking at really short time windows. Well, well, for both Oklahoma and COSO. So we're just looking at five hours after the P wave arrival um, from these distant earthquakes. Uh, once you get outside that five hour window, it can be difficult to uh, distinguish whether things are related directly to that imposed transient stress, or if it's just it, you know, an earthquake sequence that's more related to fluid injection. Okay. Um, Tian Sun um, asks, the dominant triggering back azimuth in COSO is interesting. Isn't it physically more reasonable to expect a relation to particle motion direction instead of wave propagation direction? If that's the case, shouldn't we see a 90 degree difference between Love and Rayleigh waves? Uh, so that's something that we need to examine further, and I, and, and I agree with you. We, we've just looked at things at a high level at this point, but it's definitely something that we need to investigate further. Okay. Um, Corinne Lermont um, asks, do you have any idea about the depth distribution of the Oklahoma seismicity? Um, <laughs> there, I, you know, I, I actually need to plot that up and look at it further. Um, but I'd assume that it, it's probably, uh, you know, the typical uh, depth distribution that we see in Oklahoma, which is, uh, has a pretty, shallow. yeah, shallow <laughs> to, to, yeah, a pretty shallow range. Right, yeah. Okay, um, thank you for the nice talk. Um, I am curious if you calculated magnitudes of triggered seismicity in COSO in Oklahoma. And in the case that you, if you did, is there a notable magnitude difference between um, static instantaneous, well, yeah, static instantaneous delayed triggering events? Um, also, does the frequency of triggered event occurrence follow characteristic decaying trends such as like a Mori aftershock type decay? Yeah, so, so what I've seen in Oklahoma, it, it seems to follow that typical uh, decay, um, yeah, a, a more yeah, like type aftershock decay. Um, and this is, what, what I'm thinking about here is specifically related to the Prague region. Uh, we've, I, I didn't show the results here, but we, we've examined the Prague region pretty extensively. And we've seen several, um, uh, several triggered sequences that show that uh, after aftershock type decay pattern. That's great. Um, Helen has a follow-up question. Just um, can you expand on why um, anthropogenic processes promote delayed triggering? So we think that uh, these uh, anthropogenic processes are promoting delayed triggering because uh, they're adding fluids to the system. And when you have these uh, transient stresses, specifically Rayleigh waves propagating through the systems, through the system, they can shake up these fluids and move, sort of diffuse them into different uh, pore pressure pockets and change these stresses on, on, on local faults. Um, and so that's what we think is going on in Oklahoma. Yeah, and even with Prague, it took quite a while before seismic activity happened there post 
you know, injection. So, yeah. Um, Joan Gomberg asks, um, what attributes of the wave fields did you examine? Have you considered the role of the trigger, triggering waves duration? Are the cases of delayed and immediate triggering always on different faults? So the wave duration is something that we're interested in looking at. Um, I'm actually going to start uh, mapping that out pretty soon for a specific sequence we're interested in. Um, and I think I, I, I might have missed part of the, the question there. Um, what was the first half, Daniel? Sure, yeah, <laughs> that's a long question. What attributes of the wave fields did you examine? Yeah, so we, we specifically looked at wave type, uh, back azimuth, and just peak dynamic stress. And so we are definitely interested in looking at the duration of uh, these surface waves uh, for these specific events and, and diving further into that. Great. Um, OK, let me get back to the other questions. OK, um, Herb uh, Dragert asks, can tidal stress play a role in the effectiveness of triggers? That's an interesting question. <laughs> um, it so is, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've seen I, I've seen some very inter interesting results for a tidal triggering in Oklahoma. Um, and now I I I think we'd have to look at them in look at tidal triggering and uh, dynamic triggering in tandem to really get at that and that answer. So I don't have an answer for that specific question. But it would, it's definitely a very interesting problem to look at. Great. Yeah, it, it is interesting. Um, Kadek Pagnati, sorry, um, thanks for the talk. Um, how did you decide that 10 hours, about the 10 hours time window? Do you consider the travel time until the Coda wave arrives? Um, another question Do you assess the directivity effect of the quote unquote, quote unquote big earthquake? to the triggered events? So on the directivity, the, the peak dynamic stress will capture that, that information, uh, the directivity information. Um, yes, we do uh, look at CODA and we mark the CODA for each, way, uh, each, uh, each teleseismic event. And that's typically included within that five hour window. Um, and the five hour window we use because we're mostly interested in instantaneous triggering because that's, we feel like that's where we can gain the most insight into these, these earth, these processes, um, because you have a direct, uh, you know, a direct stress that's actually causing these events to trigger. Um, yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, so Bradford Hager asks, shear waves generate compression and dilatation on planes oriented at 45 degrees to the direction of propagation. Could fluid fill filled fractures lead to dynamic triggering for love waves? I am not sure. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah um, my first thought is no, <laughs> but I, 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 I'm not sure. Great, yeah, okay, let's see. So, Kellen Wang asks, is there a correlation between the abundance of induced seismicity and teleseismically triggered seismicity? Is there a correlation between the abundance of triggered seismicity and induced seismicity? Yeah, so teleseismically so, triggered, yeah, and induced, yep. I, you, you know, Yes and no, because well, as you induce more seismicity, you're causing more faults to become to to sort of reach a critical state of stress. So, yes, I would assume you get more uh, dynamically triggered events as you create more critically stressed faults related to fluid injection. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, we do have a few more minutes. I don't know how many extra slides, you know, you have, but William Harbert did ask that he would like to see them. So I was kind of just waiting till the last to see that we got through all the questions. So if you'd like to show them, you know, please oh, sure. do. 
Sure, yeah, so I can I can skim through a couple of these slides. Um, let's see. <laughs> so um, some of my research at uh, Los Alamos has focused on, uh, you know, further exploiting uh, dynamically triggered earthquakes to investigate uh, critically stressed uh, areas of Oklahoma. Um, so since I've come to LANL, there's a, a group that's developed a, a machine learning catalog uh, that's specific to Oklahoma, and they've uh, identified over 30,000 events throughout Oklahoma, identified and cataloged over 30,000 events throughout Oklahoma that's from 2010 to 2012. And so you can show, you can see the plot here. We have the Oklahoma Geologic Surveys catalog in blue. And these white circles are the machine learning catalog. Um, and we're specifically interested in the Prague area right here that's in the black box. Um, so for this specific region, uh, we're examining seismicity uh, prior to the uh, Prague, the Prague, Oklahoma earthquake in 2011. It was a magnitude 5.7. Um, we think that this, this sequence uh, offers a really unique opportunity to examine whether earthquake triggering can reflect uh, changing stress conditions related to fluid, fluid injection. Um, and so we use triggered earthquakes to probe the state of stress on, on this fault. Um, so using that specific uh, catalog, we're able to, I, I should mention that um, dynamic triggering in this region was identified by Van der Elts in 2013. Uh, and that was related to a Chile earthquake in 2010. Um, but we were able to identify three new cases of remote dy dynamic triggering um, in the Prague area um, related to some uh, other nearby uh, events. So they're labeled below. Um, here we have an, a sequence that's uh, triggered by an Aleutian, the Aleutian, uh, Aleutian Islands, Alaska earthquake um, in 2010. It was a magnitude 6.4. Uh, we have another sequence that was um, triggered by the uh, Chile earthquake in 2011, it was a 6.9, and another event that was uh, from, originated from the Vancouver Islands in uh, September of 2011. Uh, so as you can see, there's a pretty rapid step increase in seismicity related to each of these events. Um, here we just have a, a magnitude versus time plot of the event. So each of these dots is an earthquake. Uh, you can see where the Alaska, Chile, and Canada earthquakes uh, show up. And when we have the Prague event, uh, when the Prague the Prague event occurs, um, as you can see, we have these three clusters of triggered earthquakes. Um, you can see where they uh, where they locate in in reference to the Prague event. Um, and so it's essentially we're, we're seeing several uh, precursory um, triggered sequences that were basically indicating that this, this area was in a critical state of stress leading up to the, the Prague event in 2011. Um, uh, an interesting thing here that we saw is uh, there's we don't have enough triggered events to 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 potentially infer this, but it seems that there may also be some sort of azimuthal dependence. Um, two of these events that triggered uh, seismicity in Prague uh, actually come from the same back azimuth and align across the same uh, same uh, great circle arc, and they look like they're coming in approximately perpendicular to the to the um, the fault orientation. Um, we've also looked at um, a couple of other sequences uh, leading up to moderately sized other moderately sized earthquakes throughout Oklahoma. That includes the Cushing the Cushing earthquake of 2016, the Pawnee earthquake of 2016, and Fairview 2016. Um, these were all above magnitude five, and we wanted to see if we saw similar. Um, <coughs> 
similar triggered sequences. Uh, this work is more preliminary than the previous uh, PREG work. Um, but initially, it looks like we're able to identify uh, several se uh, triggered sequences leading up to the, these moderately sized earthquakes. So highlighted here uh, in different colors are teleseismic events that are associated with triggered sequences leading up to these moderately sized earthquakes. Um, I'd be happy to explain that further if there's any questions, but these are of course just preliminary figures for these, these regions. Um, so we have Pawnee here, Fairview and the Cushing events here. Um, and this is just a zoom in on where these locate. So as you go from cooler tone colors to warmer colors, you get, you're getting closer and closer to the onset of the uh, moderately sized event in Oklahoma, which are indicated by these red stars. Um, yeah, and that's, that's all I've got. Be happy to answer any questions, any further questions on those. Oh, that just thank you for including that extra material. I think that was super interesting. And um, yeah, just thank you for that. So um, I wanted to say thank you everyone for joining us today. And I wanted to remind everyone that registration for the 2021 Gage Sage Workshop on revealing Earth systems, integrating spatial and temporal data opens on June 1st. And the virtual meeting will take place between August 17th through the 19th of 2021. And so I hope everyone can join us then. This webinar also concludes the winter spring edition of uh, IRIS webinar series, and we will resume in the fall of 2021. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Take care, have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. All right, take care everyone. <laughs>